Amen. Thank you, Tammy. It's now time for our children, ages 4 through 8, to be dismissed to Children's Church. Children ages 4 through 8, this is your opportunity for separate activities for your age group. While they're making their way downstairs, I invite you to find your way to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, this morning as we begin to continue a series, we just wrapped up the Sunday before Easter, we wrapped up our study of the Beatitudes, Christ's opening uh, monologue, if you would, his opening teachings on a, uh, a, a set of scriptures become known as the Sermon on the Mount. This morning we're going to continue with the rest of that, uh, my sermon schedule, having a look at it. We will go through, math, through, uh, through the balance up through Matthew chapter 7, that will take us the rest of this year to do so. We will have a couple of Sundays that are special emphasis, but we're going to spend the balance of this year looking at the Sermon on the Mount. We'll wrap up right before the Christmas season. Today, as you see, the title of the sermon is Salt and Light. Salt and Light. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16 will be our focal passage. I invite you to read that with me in just a moment. Before we get there, when I was looking at salt and light and contemplating this, this sermon, I said, well, what's... What are some things I could do to illustrate salt and light? So I, I did like all good scholars do. We go to Google and search in salt and light, and I found something was very interesting to me. There was this contraption. If I was a man of, of many means, I might contribute toward the funding this project. But since I am not, I will not. But there is a project seeking funding right now. It's called the Hydrolite. Uh, the Hydrolite PL500. Uh, I don't know how it got its name, but it did. And this is a project that's seeking funding through the Kickstarter uh, website on the internet. Now this, uh, this piece of equipment will require nothing more than salt and water. Salt water. And when you put that in this, the hydrolyte energy cell it will, is designed so that with salt water applied to it, it's ready to use when you need it. When stored dry, the internal parts actually generate electricity, and those parts should last for 25 years, the de designer says. Adding salt and water to the energy cell instantly activates it and starts the process of energy generation. Storage of this slow and steady stream of electricity is handled by a lithium-ion battery that's sandwiched between the energy cell and the lantern. And what this is designed to do is, if it's funded, if it gets made in production, you can add salt water to this, you can charge your USB devices, your, your cell phones, etc., and you can do a lantern at the top. You see it, that beautiful display of a lantern up there. I'm sure that is a high lumen lamp to run off of salt water. But salt and water, taking salt and making light of it, is, is that not clever? Are you not thoroughly impressed with my research on the internet? It, you know, but salt and light, that's one way to do it, but there's a better way. Amen? Today, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, a better use of salt and better way to produce life. You honor the Word of God, if you're willing and able to stand with me this day. Again, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, your neighbor will share with you. There should be a copy in the pew Bible in, front, in the pew pocket in front of you. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, reading, reading through verse 16, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. These are the words of Christ, where He says, You are the salt of the earth. Speaking to all those listening, and by extension, you and I. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Father God, this morning, as I humbly attempt to, to take this Word and, and to bring it to this audience, Father, these people who are listening today, may I bring forth a message that you intend and no other. May we hear what you intend and nothing else. And may we apply this to our hearts as you intend to be the people that you desire. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
I'm sure you know Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Therefore, it is the first in the linear progression of the New Testament where we see the words of Christ. And we're getting to a point in the New Testament following the words of Christ, the teachings of Christ, where we really see Him at His best. Jesus has often been described as the master teacher. As the master teacher. Jesus was one who was very gifted at being able to speak in a way in which the the, the audience of that day could hear Him, to understand Him, and and, and take in what He was saying and, and comprehend what He was saying. Now, He often spoke in parables. And sometimes those parables were hard to understand. Even His disciples would question on that. But He also was very gifted at taking everyday, ordinary, common items and events in people's lives and using those to make a point. Here in Matthew, he started off over in chapter 4, if you would, where he first called his disciples. These were fishermen, common blue-collar type workers, how we call them today, hard-working men who would go out and forge a living on the waters. And he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. And, and they realized what that meant. They were, they were already living that lifestyle, if you would. But he was going to, to expand that in a, a kingdomly, spiritual sort of way so they could be fishers of men. When we looked at the Beatitudes here in the past several weeks, we saw these, these times where Jesus was pronouncing these, or giving these pronouncements of blessings and talking about the ways in which we can be blessed. And I'm sure it shocked that audience of that day as it does ours today because many of those pronouncements or blessings didn't seem to be people who were blessed at all, people who were going through difficult times, people who were facing the trials of life. But He said, you are blessed. You are blessed. You're blessed indeed. He says such things as, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle or the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Even blessed are those who've been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. He's saying all these people are blessed. All these people are blessed. And when he's saying that, I'm sure the audience that day up on this hillside off the, the, the Sea of Galilee, they, they, he had their attention. He had their attention. It was a people who did, did not feel blessed. And in, in fact, they felt very oppressed. They were looking for a Messiah. They wanted somebody to come in to, to rule their nation, to cast out the, the Roman Empire, to cast off this, these foreign armies and foreign emperors that were, that were dominating over them, who were domineering them, controlling their land. They weren't feeling blessed. But he's saying you can't be blessed. You will be blessed. And he gave these spiritual lessons. He had their attention. And now, when we get to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, where he says, You are the salt of the earth. That was very common understood. They, they, they knew what salt was. They knew what it did. They knew, they knew all about the salt. And then he, he's getting their attention even more. He's using common items to teach these spiritual lessons. Salt. They knew what it was. Salt. We know what it is. For most of us, it looks something like that on the screen. We're used to seeing a salt shaker and salt spilled. And If you spill salt, what do you do? You take a pinch and throw it over your shoulder or some, some silliness like that. But we know what salt is, but, but, but do you know what it really is? Well, I'm going to give you the definition of what salt is from the Holman Bible Dictionary. Salt is sodium chloride. How many chemists in the room knew that? Okay, a couple smarties out there. But the rest of us, I thought I impressed you with my knowledge, did I not? Sodium chloride is the chemical name for salt. And it is an abundant material. It's used, Scripture talks about it all the time. Job talks about it being a seasoning for food. 
It's, it's also uh, it's used in offerings. We see that back in the Levitical Code of the Old Testament. Ezekiel speaks to it. As preservative, salt was symbolic of covenants. We see that in Numbers in 2 Chronicles. And, and here's a seasoning and as a preservative. Both those meanings are present. When Jesus is comparing the disciples, the listeners, the followers of His day to salt. To salt. But salt was also a symbol of desolation and barrenness. Perhaps because of the barrenness of the Dead Sea, the biblical salt sea. The salt pits of Zephaniah 2.9 were probably located just south of the Dead Sea. Sodium chloride could leach out of the generally impure salt from this area and leave a very tasteless substance. So the people knew what Jesus was talking about. Jesus knew what they were talking about and... When I was doing my research on, on salt for this sermon, one of the things I found out is that the two elements, the sodium and the chloride, separately, they could be very dangerous. Especially the chloride. Chlorine gas is a very deadly thing. It, 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 it can cause great harm or even death. And sodium by itself is not very good, but the sodium chloride, sodium chloride together, God has put these two together to make something of great benefit. Of great benefit. Salt, by the way, has long been an important commodity in human activities. How many of y'all have ever had a job? Raise your hand. How many of y'all hope to have a job? Raise your hand. How many of y'all, what do you want the job for? The money. In the English terms, we call that salary. The salary. Do you know what salary means? Where we get the root of it from? Salary traces back to the Latin word salarium. Anybody know what a salarium is? That was the salt cakes that were used to pay the Roman soldiers. And the part of their, their, their payment was salt cakes. How many of y'all are glad your employer doesn't give you salt cakes for a paycheck? Can I get an amen in the house? You know? But, but uh, they, they, the, the solarium, the salt cakes, it was, it was used in trade. Roman soldiers got that. that was, the solarium was part of their pay. That's where the salary comes from. Have you ever heard the term, that person's not worth their salt? That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. Salt. So it's been around a long time, and it, it has some very significant... It's uh, characteristics to that. By the way, we're going to pick up in the notes in your bulletin right now, the outlines contained within that. We're going to talk about some characteristics of salt which will help us to understand the lesson that Jesus is teaching, the spiritual lesson, where he says, you're the salt of the earth, this is verse 13, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. I found these five points, if you would, these, these five characteristics. These are not unique to, to my, uh, my, my great knowledge or anything like that. I, I found these under one of my favorite pastors. How many of y'all remember uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers? He preached a sermon one time called Salty Saints. And he talked about the five characteristics. I borrowed that list. I added to it my own commentary around it. But these are from, from Dr. Adrian Rogers. At least five characteristics of salt that we must consider. First of all, salt seasons. Salt seasons. We know that. We know that, do we not? Salt was valuable back in the biblical times because of what it did. And one of the things that salt does is to cause flavor to come alive. Flavor to come alive. In the book of Job, we read this question. It says, Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Job chapter 6, verse 6. I give an amen to that. Amen. How many of y'all, some of y'all out there, I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but I think it's poor. I, I just want to see how you can do it. Though these egg white omelets and stuff like that that, 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 that just ain't right. That just ain't right, you know. But, but at any rate, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, Job's comparing it tasteless like the white of an egg. Like the white of an egg. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? How many of y'all like to put salt on your food? Amen? How many of y'all sprinkle it on there before you even taste the thing? 
Oh, I know baby girl does that, and I fuss at her sometimes. I'm not one, however it comes out, I usually eat it. You know, good, bland, or otherwise. Sometimes if it's really bad, I'll add something to there. You know, but, but what's something you put salt on? French fries. French fries, okay, what else? Tomatoes, what else? Grits, okay, I, we could go on and on. Uh, I, I, how many of y'all put salt on your cantaloupe? All right, well, all right. <laughs> You know, I love cantaloupe. I love fresh summer cantaloupe. Some of that stuff you're getting right now shipped in from Mexico, they ain't got, no, they got the color of no flavor, uh-uh. But when the summer cantaloupe gets here, that's good. But I like to sprinkle salt on there. Cantaloupe is sweet. It's sweet. What's the, what, what, is, is salt sweet? No, it's not sweet, but it draws the flavor out of that cantaloupe. It draws the flavor out of that cantaloupe. In the summertime, when I give me a fresh cantaloupe, I cut that up into slices. I sprinkle my salt on there. I take me a big old bite of that slice of cantaloupe. You know one thing I don't say? Oh, that sure was good salt. <laughs> what, what do we think of? We talk about that tomato. We talk about the cantaloupe. We talk about the, you know, how, how good that item was because salt adds the flavor. It draws the flavor out. Salt is used for seasoning. Amen? Amen? You know, but, but Jesus talks about we're the salt of the earth, but the salt loses its flavor or its saltiness is good for nothing. He goes back to that blandness, like the white of an egg that Job's talking about. Blandness. Do you know someone whose life is bland? Maybe it's your life. Maybe you're, you're, just, you're going through this existence. Nothing there really. No flavor. No flavor. Just bland. Maybe, just maybe, you need something to, some salt in it. Sprinkle it up. Bland. Tasteless. Without excitement or stimulation. Some people find themselves there and they'll try to, quote, flavor their lives, try to season it with, with the wrong types of seasoning. They'll try to find some type of zest in the crowd. They'll try to heighten their senses with worldly excitement, with, with cheap thrills, with a, an unnatural high. And when they try that, they fall short of their desires every single time. Every single time. Adrian Rogers, the man who I told you I got these five characteristics from, he described that in his sermon as the bland leading the bland. Kind of a takeoff on the blind leading the blind. But see, we as Christians are to be different. That's the reason the Bible says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, says, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. You know, there ought to be something very exciting about living the Christian life. Amen? Amen? Our life is to be seasoned. Salt is one of the things that salt does. It seasons, but it also preserves Salt preserves. By the way, back in the biblical times, salt was valuable. Although it's plentiful, it's hard to necessarily get to some places so it's used to trade with. What can you buy salt for at the grocery store? You can buy a five-pound bag for less than a dollar, I imagine. You know, I don't know what it costs. We don't even think about the cost of salt. But, but back in biblical days, it was, it, was very, it was very valuable. And it was used to preserve. And when I think of salt preserving, I can't help but think back to my grandpa. I'll tell you about my grandpa. He had that farm up in Duncan, South Carolina. He worked fair forest, cotton mill, for his main job, and after that he'd come home and work the farm. And he raised corn, he had a corn mill. He'd grind up corn mill to feed his, his hogs that he raised. He'd sell corn mill, he raised these hogs. He would sell the hogs, he'd slaughter the hogs, and he preserved the hogs. And how did he preserve the hogs? Salt. 
And, and 50 years later, I can still taste that salt-cured ham that my, grand, my grandpa would make. Oh, isn't that mouth water right now? Some of y'all right now think, I'm going to go home and throw out that roast and get me a salt-cured ham for lunch today. You know? But he, he would he'd preserve you know, he, he, the, the hams and the, the pigs, the hogs, in the salt. <coughs> Excuse me. In this section of Scripture here that we're studying now, on Sunday mornings, Jesus was standing again on this hill by the Sea of Galilee, teaching. And of course, the section here on the Sermon on the Mount, but a big portion of the audience that day were fishermen. Fishermen. These are men who probably just come off the water, they, they tied up their boat, they gathered in their nets, their, their, their catch, they, they hung the nets out to dry, and they see this crowd following this, this teacher up a hill. And out of curiosity, they probably went and joined in the crowd to hear what this, this man had to say. Many of them had no idea who Jesus was. But when he's talking about the salt of the earth and knowing that salt is preserved, that's pro- they, they, they identify with that. Because back in those days, that's how you preserve the fish as well. You, you preserve them in the salt. Much like my grandpa, after he slaughtered the hogs, would preserve the ham and the pork in, in that. They were fishermen. They understood what he meant when he told them that they were to be salt of the earth. Because Jesus here, He, doesn't, he did not say, I am the salt of the earth. What did He say? You are the salt of the earth. And because of their occupation and their life experience, they knew that Jesus was talking about the preserving power of salt as well as the seasoning power of salt. Salt is used in biblical times to preserve and to restrain corruption. It was necessary to salt the fish down to keep them from decaying after the catch. Today we have refrigeration. Today we have freezers. We have other ways of preserving. But back then, they were limited to salt. Consider the world in which we live today. (coughs) Pardon me. If we are the salt of the earth, as Jesus says we are, then it's up to us to serve as preservation agents and to prevent the world from further decay. Amen? We are the salt of the earth. We're to be the seasoning for the earth. We're to help preserve the earth. I'm not talking about some tree-hugging thing out there. All that's going to burn away in fire at the end times, right? What's going to remain is our souls. We need to be preserving agents for the souls of ourselves and other people. That's what we need. Jesus said, we're the salt of the earth. He's saying, I'm going to use you to preserve all these people to be in my kingdom for my glory, my Father's glory. Amen? Salt seasons. Salt preserves. Salt heals. Salt heals. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, we read of Elisha, the great prophet. He put some salt into some deadly polluted waters. It's called bitter waters in the King James, I believe. And once he added this salt to the bitter waters, those waters were healed, and out of barrenness and bitterness there came blessedness. How so? Well, salt has antiseptic and healing properties to it. As a matter of fact, as I understand it, in biblical times, when little babies were born, they'd give that baby a saline bath. What's saline? Salt water. A mild, mild form of salt water. They'd give that baby a saline bath to hold down infection after the birth of the child. How many of you have ever soaked a wound in a bath of Epsom salts? Yeah. 
I remember as a child, whenever I get something on my foot, an infection or something like that, grandmama, my, my nanny, my nanny Neville, as we call her, she, she'd put, pr- prepare this, this big old tin tub full of hot water, put Epsom salts in there. That salty water would serve to draw out the infection that was present in the wound. Salt heals. Salt heals. The question is, do you know of someone whose life has become toxic and their soul is in need of healing? I'm sure you do. In fact, it may be you. It may be you. As the salt of the earth, you may very well be the spiritual healing agent that God is trying to send to them. Salt sees and salt preserves, salt heals and... Salt irritates. Salt irritates. Have you ever cut your hand or skinned your knee or had some other kind of flesh wound and then got salt in it? If so, you know that salt can be a very irritating substance. Salt, when it's applied to an open wound, definitely causes pain. Can I get an amen in the house? The sting of the salt can cause a very intense burning sensation. Salt burns and it irritates. It's not pleasant when it's applied to sensitive skin or open wounds. But we all know people who are dead in their sin without Christ. They can be described as the walking wounded in need of spiritual healing. And to them, the truth of God's Word may sting like salt applied to an open wound. There are many people who want a non-irritating brand of the Gospel. But as Adrian Rogers put it in his sermon, Dear friend, No offense means no effect. The gospel's irritating. It burns. It hurts. We don't want it applied sometimes because it's convicting. But it's that conviction that God uses to show us our need for a Savior. It needs to burn. I've told y'all before that there's going to be times when I preach from this pulpit. I hope more times than not when the words I say will hurt. It's like I'm stepping on your toes. I hope that's the case because the gospel is offensive. It burns. It hurts. But it's necessary. It's necessary. We need to have our sin exposed before our own very eyes so that we can cleanse ourselves to approach a holy God. The gospel irritates. No offense means no effect. So salt sees and salt preserves. Salt heals, salt irritates, but also salt penetrates. Salt penetrates. A little bit of salt can go a long way. If you don't believe me, try this at lunch today. How many of y'all going to have some sweet tea with lunch? Y'all Southern, ain't you? Anybody going to have some sweet tea with lunch today? All right, very good. At least somebody in the house is listening and honest with me. When you have that sweet tea today, I want you to take a big old sip of that and say, oh, that is so good. It's good to be from the South where we serve sweet tea. Amen? Those Yankees got it all wrong. No offense to those y'all from up yonder ways. But, but uh, sweet tea. Now, now I've got to confess something. My doctor's an evil man. And he, <laughs> and he took me off sweet tea. So I drink unsweet tea and pretend like it's sweet. But, but, but take that sweet tea and take just a pinch of salt and sprinkle it. 
and tell me how much you like it then. Because it don't take much salt to go a long way. A little bit of salt can penetrate a whole lot of sweetness. Amen? The gospel is such a simple thing. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. One verse in the Bible. One verse encapsulates the entirety of the gospel message. A little gospel goes a long way. Amen? Jesus said we are the bearers of that. We are the salt of the earth. We're the ones that just a little bit of our witness can have profound impact in that world out there. We can change the world if we'll just go out there and just do a little bit of sprinkling where it's needed out there. Amen? Salt! Salt of the earth. You are the the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. By men. So that's salt. But Jesus also talks about we're the light of the world. Look at verses 14 through 16 again. He says, You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we'll look at four characteristics of light. Four characteristics of light. Now folks, I want to show you how brilliant I am. I came up with these on my own. I, I didn't need Adrian Rogers to help me on this one. But light, light. One thing about light is we know that light attracts. Light attracts. And maybe y'all have a porch light outside. How many of y'all know what happens if you turn that porch light on at night? Every critter with wings comes to it. Good and bad. Every, light is something that is attractive. And it's not just for the critters out there, it's for you and I. If we see something that's bright, well lit up, it gets our attention. It gets our attention. Well, Jesus says, you're the light of the world. And because of you, by letting your light shine, people are going to be drawn to me. We're the ones who display the light of the Gospel. And when we display that light and let it shine, the world is attracted. And they want to know what it is about that light. Amen? The light attracts. Light attracts. But light also, we know this, has to come from a source. Light has to have a source. So what's the Bible say about what the source is? Well, first of all, we know that Scripture is one of the sources. The Bible itself, thy word, is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. One of the sources of light is God's word, the Bible. Why? Because that ultimately points to Jesus. Amen? That's what the Bible does. (coughs) The Bible is a source. Jesus himself is a source. Here in in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he says that we, you, are the light of the world. But in John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Who's the light of life? Jesus himself. John talks about that in his opening. Uh, 
In his opening verses of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Verse 4, In Him was life. And the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, but yet the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate source. We, we've heard the illustration, we've used it in, in Sunday school classes, sermons, everything else. In the natural world, what is the, our source of natural light? The sun. The sun is the source, the, the source of natural light in this world. But the moon also show, works to illumine the evening sky. Does the moon have any light unto itself, any source of light within it? No, it's just reflecting off of this, the, the light of the sun is reflecting off of that onto, into the evening sky. The moon is not the source, but it's reflecting the source. And that's what you and I are called to do. In fact, Saints are the, the, the light of the world. Because Jesus says so in Matthew 5, 14, where He says, you are the light of the world. Ultimately, we are just reflecting the light that shines within us. Amen? This light that's shining upon us. Jesus is the light. We get the light from the, from the Bible. The light is ultimately Jesus Himself. We're a reflection of that light. And people will be attracted because of that. But, another characteristic of light is, not only does it need to have a, a does it attract and need to come from a source, but it can be blocked. Light can be blocked. Look again at verse 15. We'll start with verse 14. <coughs> Pardon me. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but instead put it on the lampstand and give light to all who are in the house. You don't light a lamp and then cover it up. You don't light a lamp and then hide it. You don't light a lamp and then shield it from being able to shine its light out there. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that you are the light of the world. Again, He's using these everyday objects, the lamp, the lampstand, Back then it was oil lamps they used, but the same thing, they'd, they'd light, light the wick on these oil lamps. The lamp would be put on a stand, it would light up the room around it, but if you were to cover that, put, put a, some type of a veil over it, it would shield the light from shining. The light would still be shining within that covering, but it wouldn't be going anywhere. And Jesus says, we're the light of the world. Don't hide that. Don't cover it. Don't shield it. Don't put a veil over it. You are the light of the world. You need to shine, shine, shine. That's what Jesus is telling us. And He wants us to do that because the final is light has the purpose to expose. Light has the purpose to expose. Light exposes obviously what's in the darkness. It exposes what's in the darkness. But in the spiritual sense, darkness is the world of sin. It needs to expose that. Light has the purpose to expose that which is not seen. That which is unseen. That which is hidden. And ultimately, we use a light to expose that which we're seeking after. Amen? That which we're seeking after. What if the light were to be extinguished? What if the light of the world was to flicker out? What hope would be left? For somebody out there, their only hope can be found in the light that you're reflecting. It may be their only way of getting the light to help them see in the darkness in a spiritual sense. Help them see that which has been blinded to them, that which is unseen, that which is hidden, that which you're seeking after. 
We're the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Well, what do we do about it? Point of application, very simple. Application. I borrowed this from Adrian Rogers. I thought it was great. We are called to shake and shine. We're called to shake and shine. I believe he talked about that some of us have become glorified salt shakers. How many of y'all got some really pretty salt shakers at your house? A lot of people collect fancy salt shakers. Some of us just have those little Morton cardboard boxes that dispense the salt. But some of you have these really elegant salt shakers. My family and I were in Gatlinburg this week, having vacation with a part of my family from Tennessee. Had a great vacation there. One of the things we did was go and explore some shops and whatnot. One of the shops we went to was a, a candy store type place and it had all kind of sweet stuff and, and they had some, I forget what flavor it was, and it was some type of a cocoa. Is a salt, is a, a flavor, is a flavored salt, if I remember correctly. I forget what it was, but anyway, it was in a salt shaker. I wanted to try it. I did. If I liked it, I might have bought it. <laughs> they had these sample shakers out there. And it was filled with this fancy flavor of whatever it was I was trying to buy. I can't even remember now. It was sugar, some type of a sugar. It was a flavored form of sugar in a salt shaker. You don't put sugar in a salt shaker, do you? But they did. But anyway, I went. I was going to try it. And I kept shaking it and shaking it. I take the thing and shake it up and try to break it up. It wouldn't let anything out. I could never try it because the, the humidity and whatnot, it caused it to, to, to clog up where the pores are at the top of the shaker. It was plugged up. I couldn't get anything out. The thing was filled with some type of a wonderful goodie that, that I wanted to try to purchase if it was good. But I didn't buy any because I couldn't try any because the shaker wouldn't let anything out. What if one of our closest friends or family members really wants to try out that salt that we have. But we're not letting anything out. We're like a salt shaker that's not letting the salt out. We're like a light that's well lit but covered up so nobody could see the brightness. Is that what we're doing? Is that what we're doing? And I dare say to one extent or another that is what we are doing. Because in today's world, right now there are more people out there in our communities and our families that are not here in our church or any other church. They're out there living worldly lives, turning to a pattern of sin, disregarding Christ or God or any of that. They have, they have no desire for the salt because we're not shaking it. We're not letting them see the light of the gospel. Therefore, they're not drawn to the light because they don't see the light. Because it's not shining in us. If the Christians of today were to say, shake the salt and shine the light like God calls us to, this world would be turned upside down just like it was in the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, they were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They openly proclaimed their faith, even in face of persecution, even in the face of being arrested, in prison, in some cases even facing martyrdom. They didn't care. They would tell the world about Christ. And people were coming to faith in Christ by the hundreds and by the thousands every single time they met. Why is the church not that way today? Why are most churches today in decline instead of growing? Our population is exploding, but the churches are dying. It's because the Christians are not being the salt of the earth or the light of the world. 
Therefore, the world sees no desire, no reason to turn to that Jesus because they've seen no evidence that He will do them any good in their life. They've seen no reason to come to Him. If we were to make a difference in the world, we've got to get out there and let them see Jesus alive in us. Amen? We must be shakers of salt and portrayers of light in the world. We are called to shake and shine. Why is the Bible-believing Christian no longer respected? Why is the Bible-believing Christian now shunned, ridiculed, etc.? Maybe it's because we've become good for nothing. Maybe it's because we've lost our saltiness. But the good news is... God has not lost His power. The Gospel has not lost its power. The cross has not lost its power. The resurrected Savior has not lost His power. One salty saint and the power of the Gospel can make the difference the world needs. What will you do about it? What will you do about it? Will you walk out of here determined to make a difference in somebody's life? Or are you going to walk out of here and say, good service today. See you next week. We'll do it again. Let's stop playing church. Let's start being the church. Amen? Father God, help us to make a difference in this world. Help us, O oh Lord, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world that Jesus was talking about. Father, we know it's not about us. It never has been. It never will be. It's all about Jesus. It's only about Jesus. Father, may we be the ones we know You've entrusted it to us, O oh Lord. We know You've given us the task of taking the Gospel message to the world and making a difference in people's lives. Now, Father, help us to live up to it. Help us to be the salt and the light. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.